Hey everybody, it's Melanie coming to you from the Outer Banks, North Carolina. And this is my buddy Lucky and Puck and Puck. He's eating his breakfast. Um, so Mr. Thron Cleaver asked, how did I break my back? Why did I cut my horse's testicles off? And why did I have to give away my horses back in, oh man, we're going back 20 years now. <laughs> so, um... Back in 2006, this guy behind me was a five-year-old stallion, and he'd fathered five babies. Oh, another question was, um, how did the one die of gunshot wound? Um, the first day of hunting season, back in 2005, I think, his name was Jumpin' Jack Flash. He was coming up through our lower pasture, and rifle bullets can travel one to two miles. And so we are guessing that it went in and lacerated his spleen twice in his liver. And he bled out internally. And then there must have been a bullet wound exit. We just couldn't find it. Um, we did a necropsy in the field with the vet and um, found out that that's what had happened. So that's how Jumpin' Jack Flash passed on. But in 2006... I was taking this guy behind me for a ride, and the sun is crazy. Um, was taking this guy for a ride, and I had left work at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I was a nurse's um, aide at the local hospital. And I left at 7 a.m., and it was supposed to be 96 degrees that day, and I decided it was best to ride be after work instead of before going to work because that's when the sun was going to be pretty hot still. So um, we went out for our ride. At around 7.45, I got there, and um, I didn't have my proper riding equipment. So I didn't have my riding pants. I didn't have my um, boots. I had nursing scrubs and flip-flops. You had to leave your shoes where you were working. And so that's what I had on. And um, I was like, well, we'll just go anyways. Like, I was used to riding bareback and never cared about being properly equipped. And we rode in the ring because we had an event coming up the next weekend, which is um, dressage, cross-country, and show jumping. So we rode in the ring, practiced, and then I took him up the hill. And the hill's about a mile away from the road going up this, like, winding logging road back and forth like this. And you get up to the very top, and there's this huge, like, 100-acre field. It was huge. And um, I went up there every day, did the same thing every day. There's a dog uh, named Patches. I called her Patches O'Houlihan from uh, Dodgeball. And um, we'd go up every day, and we would ride and I would let him gallop as fast as he wanted. There's a kitty, like, touching the phone and stuff. <laughs> I'd let him go as fast as he wanted to go, and it was a treat for both of us. That day, that fateful day, the dog didn't ride all the way to the end of the field with us. She waited. And when we rode back the other direction and we were galloping, that dog was standing there waiting and started bouncing from side to side, like, in a playful manner, and spooked Lucky. And he veered off to the side and then he spooked again and they said from that place that he spooked the second time I flew 12 feet from him when I landed I landed on my butt and then rolled back and it's hard for me to do this with a phone in my hand but it broke my sternum in two places here um, trying to hold on to the reins so he wouldn't run because he left me he left me to die did you hear that yeah he left me to die <laughs> and I knew he was going to um, the impact of hitting my butt on the ground and uh that caused a burst fracture where there was a compression and then it exploded from the stress from the inside out. And that was bur burst fracture of my L1 vertebrae. I had already had multiple back injuries from riding horses over the years and have five herniated discs to show for it. Um, that was back in 2013. So um, I the back pain didn't bother me. What really bothered me was my sternum breaking. So a couple of things happened that day. I had my cell phone with me, and I never had my cell phone with me, and it was one of those, like, Rota Motorola Razor pink flip phones. Um, I always left it in the car, and there was no reception anywhere except the one place that I fell off. It happened to be in my nursing scrub pocket because I had taken it into work and forgot to take it out of my pocket. At that point, we didn't have, re like, Pandora and stuff on the phone, so it was just a phone to call and text, and I never took it riding. Um, because of my pants, they were slippery in the saddle, 
And that was a big reason why I fell off. I didn't have the same gripping that I would have if I were wearing riding pants that have like patches on the knees um, and grips on the bottom to help you stay stuck to the saddle. So lucky, hang on, I gotta fix this. Hello, we're back. He's now munching on all the bits that he left on the ground because he's a piggy. But uh, so I fell off in the one place in that property that actually got cell phone service and I was able to make phone calls, which was amazing. Um, nobody would have known where I was if I had screamed for days. Nobody would have heard me. Um, I got very, very lucky in that respect. And uh, I called my sister who told me I needed to call for help and I didn't want to, but I did. And I called the owner of the farm. And he came up and he tried to pick me up off the ground and my sternum felt like somebody was taking an axe to the front of my chest without any any, any anesthesia. And uh, it was one of the most excruciating things I've ever experienced in my life and I've given birth to three children via C-section. Um, it was awful. And uh, because I had that phone, I was able to reach out, get help. Um, an ambulance ended up coming. They almost had to call a helicopter. They weren't sure they would make it up the logging road, <laughs> but they did. Um, I had to refuse a back brace and I had to refuse a neck collar. I couldn't lay flat and I couldn't have the neck collar on because the pain was too excruciating. There's a cat hitting. Say what's up, kitty? Um, there was, I had to be medicated with five milligrams of morphine before leaving. By the time we got to the highway, they medicated me with another four, five milligrams of morphine. And when we got to the hospital, they gave me another three and a half milligrams of Dilaudid. I was still unable to walk to the bathroom. The pain was so excruciating. Um, it ended up causing big issues with the local hospital because they did not get an MRI, they did not consult the neurosurgeon, and they tried to discharge me and send me home. And my mother, thank goodness, she worked at the hospital, she said no, and went and pulled the neurosurgeon out of surgery <laughs> and told him that he had to see and assess my daughter. A lot of people got fired. During that experience, he was pushing me out of the way. A lot of people got fired during that experience um, because of their neglect, and it was a big deal. Um, I was in the hospital for three days. I ended up being on a Dilaudid PCA pump, um, which is person patient choice an analgesia. And so you like pushed a button to receive pain medicine. Um, this began my sort of journey with opioid addiction. This was, um, it didn't begin right then, but it was something that haunted me later. Um, going through three pregnancies back to back, I was pregnant breastfeeding for four and a half years. That puts a toll on your hips and your back and your spine. And so that's when my addiction did begin, um, was during my pregnancy with my second daughter. And that was because of the pain I was experiencing on a daily basis. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't walk. I couldn't function. I couldn't be a mother anymore to my other child that I had my little toddler at home. Um, so I ended up abusing and using opioids to get through it. And that's how that came about. So after breaking my back, um, I had gone to see him and care for him every day at the farm that he was at. I would feed him. I would pick his stall. I paid $200 a month to keep him there. And um, I spent every day there making sure that he was taken care of. And uh, when I broke my back, I couldn't do that anymore. And I couldn't work, so I couldn't afford to pay somebody else to take care of him for me. And so began our journey. He's off going to go find some grass. Uh, I began trying to look for a new place to keep him and because he was a stallion many places did not want him so this began the journey of castrating my homeboy and boy was he mad um, I had to move him from his friends again and he was isolated and he was pissed he didn't want to be there and then I came in and I did that to him and I had to at that point in my life, I guess I was up against a wall. Um, we couldn't bring him back to the farm where my parents' house is because he would impregnate all the horses again because <laughs> we didn't have the right um, fences to be able to separate them. So he got castrated. Fun fact, the dude where I was keeping him that lived there when I was growing up, Benny Hatfield, took his testicles and put them in one of his friend's mailboxes. 
that's what we did in redneck rural New York. <laughs> so Lucky's testicles, I actually ended up in a plastic bag in someone's mailbox. I believe Ryan Fenner. I am sorry for that. I didn't know what he had planned to do with those testicles. Um, and yeah, so that happened. Um, I answered, I think I answered all the questions. Oh, no, I didn't. So then in 2013, when I had our Lulu, um, I had to deliver a baby foal a week before my due date in the middle of February, upstate New York, with wind, snow, storm, like it was awful. And one of our ponies was delivering her baby. And uh, it... I realized that I wasn't able to do everything that I wanted to do anymore. And my family was no longer supporting me with the horses because they didn't want to do it anymore. And about three weeks after our middle daughter was born, um, hang on one more second. Sorry about that. So I just put him, um, in this other little field so he can sit and graze on the edge because he likes to eat some grass. But, um, so at that point, I did not have the means to be able to take care of these horses, and my family no longer wanted to help me take care of the horses. And so, um, I gave them away. And Max and Lucky were the best of friends. Max was his fifth child. He was a beautiful, um, chestnut and white paint so he's this like red color he was a tobiano paint um he was beautiful he was still a stallion at that point he was the sweetest horse i had started working with him um training him to ride and i had to stop after getting pregnant um and when he was given away they said it changed him forever and it broke his soul he was unrideable he was unbreakable that's what they said and I believe he ended up in slaughter in Canada and he's haunted me the whole thing has haunted me for years because I wish I'd done more I wish I'd fought harder um, however I guess looking back now, everything happens for a reason, and had I stayed on that path, maybe I never would have become vegan, who knows, um, having all of those horses would have definitely changed my life forever. It was one of those choice point moments where we are presented with a crossroads and each direction takes us on a different journey, but they are very, very different journeys. Um, I was able to keep Lucky. He was very lonely for a very long time. Which was mean. Because they know. They, they know. And they make family relationships and friendships. Uh, quick story to go with this and then I'm going to end it. Um, when I was a little girl, my parents bought me a pony. And uh, she was a uh, Chincoteague pony where they swim them across the canal and auction them off. A uh, fear-driven practice. And she was seven and I was seven and her name was Seastar. And my mom tried to buy another horse at the same time from the horse dealer, but he wouldn't sell her. Her name was Annie. Fast forward to when I was 12. My mom was able to convince the man to give us Annie. And when she came to the farm, Seastar separated herself from the herd and went to be with Annie. She stood at the barn. She knew she was there. She called to her. She whinnied to her. She talked to her. And we had to keep her in quarantine, I think, for three to seven days or something. I don't, I just prevent disease from being transmitted and stuff like that, I guess. But when we finally released her into the herd, Seastar stayed with her. And they were inseparable from that point until they both died, um, Gosh, it was like 14 or 15 years later. I couldn't believe at that age that they remembered each other. 
I didn't, that consciousness didn't fully drop in to my awareness until definitely after going vegan. But um, yeah, horses remember each other. It's heartbreaking when people buy them and sell them and never think about their friendships, um, who's in their life, any of that. It's, not, it's all completely disregarded for the um, benefit of the person exploiting them. So one of the other reasons why I don't really engage in the horse business anymore. Um, and yeah. So that's my journey with horses and breaking my back and my beginning stages of drug addiction and how I got to that point and all of that. And um, I hope this video brings you a little bit of insight and maybe teaches you something. Who knows? But I'm going to take this man and we're going to get him back in his home. And then I'm going to go and enjoy my last day off before going to fetch my kids. So I hope you all have a blessed day. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Um, I hope that you're finding your gratitude and you live in your life to the best of your ability and not letting the little things get you down. So with all that said, so much peace, so much love, so much namaste. Adios, guys. Blah, blah, I can't talk anymore. All right, adios.